Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Northeast Georgia History Center and our live stream Wednesdays. I have what I think is a fantastically interesting topic for us today, historical European martial arts. So there's a lot to this. This is definitely going to be one of those in a nutshell sort of presentations because in the last 20 years, so much has come to light. And of course, we're talking about a huge part of the past, of a large uh, time span of years. So we want to go ahead and get started, and we can go to our first slide and get right into it. So um, historical European martial arts, what is it? Well, it is a martial art. That means it is a practice of, of combat, of strikes, of blows. It is a thing that one learns techniques with. And that means that there are learnable techniques, that there are practices and aspects to this particular fighting style. It is very much research focused. Uh, again, the, the, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but the, you could say rebirth of historical European martial arts means that it didn't really come about as a martial art until the 1990s. Uh, you know, of course it, it happened back in the day, right? When it was first live and going on, but, but there aren't, there's not a long tradition of people, you know, teaching someone and teaching someone and teaching someone. There's not long lines of masters and students. People have begun to research this very seriously, but it's research focused. And being research focused and the fact that there are no modern European martial arts masters means that some of it is educated guesswork very often. A lot of the manuals we have from the medieval and Renaissance period, of course, are static line drawings that capture a single moment in time. So those who understand body dynamics and how weapons work sort of have to take those static line drawings and transform them and transcribe them into motion, into movement, into strikes and things like that. So it's very, very much uh, guesswork. It is physically demanding, again, if you do it right. This is true of any uh, physical activity, especially martial arts, but this is something where there is a lot of movement. There's when you're actually in the moment taking part in the sparring or in going through the techniques and, and learning the different strikes and defenses, your entire body, body is physically active. This is not something where you're going to get big arms and, and, or, you know, and that's it. There's a lot of movement involved. And there are competitions. It's, it's competitive. Now, you know, like, like uh, traditional Eastern martial arts, like karate tournaments and things like that, they're, they focus on learning the martial art, but there are also ways for people to compete and kind of learn, you know, how they can do against an opponent where they're not just going through motions and practicing techniques, but in actual controlled fights. And Western martial arts is mostly, but not exclusively, weapons focused. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit too, but you know, Western martial arts, the way the West has fought, most people have had access to some kind of weapons. There are some unarmed aspects uh, to Western martial arts, but generally speaking, these are going to be weapons-focused uh, approaches. Um, and it's really important to know that because of the rebirth and because, you know, th this may surprise some of you. I don't want to give a spoiler alert, but here in the United States, we are not Europe. We are very much of European descent and, and culture and things like that, but many of these original uh, manuals and a lot of the original weapons, of course, are in Europe. And so one of the fascinating things about HEMA is that it is an international community and people talk to each other, communicate with each other, they share ideas, they share different approaches. And so some of the things we're going to have, you're going to hear some folks with, with non-American accents, and, and that to me is just absolutely fascinating. Now... <clears throat> there are some things that HEMA is not, and it's also important to talk about that. Uh, HEMA is not necessarily historic reenactment. Things I take part in, if you've watched any of our shows, you know I like to dress up in interesting costumes from the past and talk about the weapons and the armor, but it's not a historical reenactment. Uh, that's historical reenactment. It's not even really living history because the focus there really is on uh, the fun of having a pretend battle or the educational aspect of talking about the material culture, the clothing, the weapons, and the cultures that created them and how they fit into those cultures. But it's not reenactment. It is not stage combat. You can use the techniques from HEMA, from European martial arts, to build 
a staged combat for movies or television or, or for the theater, but they are not the same thing. When you're learning staged combat, you're not learning necessarily how to sword fight and how to sword fight in a European fashion. And generally speaking, uh, it does not involve missile weapons. As a matter of fact, uh, it, now of course I'm uh, sort of talking about bows and arrows and slings and things like that that did exist historically in ancient and medieval Europe. But one of the reasons we lost so much of these uh, European martial arts is because of the advent and widespread adoption of firearms. When you can train uh, a peasant or, or a lower class person in a couple of days to use a weapon that can bring down the most perfectly trained person with a sword, you're going to start adopting that in military fashion. And so, of course, with, uh, when gunpowder weapons come along and they become widespread, the traditional historical European martial arts tend to be on the decline. They're not going to be as common. People are not going to be going to schools or taking the methods of learning them, so they go away. Uh, within the world of HEMA, it's not rank-based. And again, you know, using the comparison of Eastern martial arts, like karate and jiu-jitsu and things like that, we think of belt levels, right? White belt, green belt, black belt. That's not what HEMA has. HEMA isn't necessarily have, well, you have learned this, so now you progress to this level and you wear this clothes, and then you progress to this level and take this test. That's not really what it's about. It's a continual uh, perfection of the techniques, and the simple fact is, the better you get at it, the better you are at it. And so it's not rank-based. And it is also not a sport. There are a lot of things out there where people wear armor, uh, whether historically based or not, protective equipment, and they have things that look like swords. They may even be real swords. And they go out there and they bash the heck out of each other in a sporting fashion, whether it's a big battle reenactment or some folks have, have started looking at Battle of the Nations where people are trying to get the, the old tournaments going. Again, while you can take European martial arts and apply that to those practices, those things in and of themselves are not European martial arts. They, they complement each other, but it is not within the HEMA mindset. So just to go over things of what HEMA is and HEMA is not. Now, from the beginning, of course, we're talking about European martial arts. European, the continent of Europe, geographically determined. Martial, meaning for warfare or for fighting. Uh, and arts, the practice of getting better at something or creating something. European martial arts. And of course, this takes us back originally to the Greeks and the Romans. Yes, you know, in Europe, they practiced martial arts. That was fighting. And, you know, the, the Greeks developed wrestling as a sport and as something to do uh, to, to get stronger. And it can also come in handy if you're in combat. The main types of fighting, again, generally speaking, the main types of fighting among the Greeks and the Romans are going to involve a sword and shield combination or a shield and spear combination. And the Greeks and the Romans use those differently. Well, this comes into the research focus part, and you're going to find, like with most history, the further back you go, the rarer and harder to find good resources are, and so this is why you don't see a lot of um, martial arts schools looking at, you know, Greek hoplites and Roman legionaries to try to determine how they fought. We have some clues based on the, the technology and the material culture, but we can't necessarily recreate it. The few things we do have, for example, we have a couple of statues and friezes of Greeks wrestling. You know, so here's a great ancient statue that shows in the middle of a wrestling move sort of a Greek hold. And, and modern high school wrestling is probably the closest thing we have competitively to Greek wrestling. And there's another one here that we can show you uh, that is uh, from a, a carving of them sort of in a move, right? It's grasping, it's holding. Uh, it's, it's, and notice how muscular these guys are, too. That's also a very important part of it. These people who practiced this were fit, and sometimes they were sort of, I don't want to use an anachronistic term, but professional athlete, athletes. People would go watch them wrestle like this. But is that a sport? Is that a martial art? Where the lines sort of blur? Now, when we get into the weapons, we also have uh, different types of combat we can look at with the Greeks. Some of the best sources we have for how they may have fought 
are the side of those Greek vases and things like that, like the one we, we see here. And again, this is still a static drawing. We know, therefore, that the Greeks held their shields a certain way. We know that they fought with their spears overhand like this and stabbed, but from this picture, you can't really see the fluidity of the motion, and there's not a series of vases that basically say, well, I'm going to paint this whole motion through, you know, and just, we don't have that, unfortunately, for the, for the Greeks. When you get to the Romans, this image is taken from Trajan's column, one of the greatest sources we have on, you know, first century and, and a little bit of second century Roman military equipment. And here is one small picture of, you know, people fighting. But again, this is very static. This is an idealized sense of what it would have been like to be in a battle. We can get some things from this. We can take some hints, but we can't really get that much. All this to say that the Greek and the Roman contribution to uh, Hema is unfortunately very small. It's there, but it's, it's, it's hard to find. When we move into the medieval period, and, and of course that moves us on to the Renaissance, we again start trying to find uh, clues where we can learn how they might have actually practiced their, their martial arts and how they might have fought. And are any of you surprised that I was able to work the Bayou Tapestry in once again? Of course I was able to. So here we have a, a part of the Bayou Tapestry, and you can see here there are men sort of right behind my hand here on foot. They're holding their shields a certain way. They're holding their spears a certain way. And again, that can be a clue. And one of the most fascinating things from this particular panel that people have looked at and drawn from is you can see the mounted figures. Yes, martial arts in Europe also involved fighting mounted because that was a major way that they fought. They're holding their, their spears two different ways. The one, the one far over here on the end, he's holding his spear overhand, right? But the fellow next to him is holding his spear in a form that we call couched. He has it tucked up under his arm that we usually think today of jousting, right? And those are two very different techniques in how you can fight, and you can use them in very different ways. The really neat part is we know that they're doing both in the 11th century thanks to the Bayou Tapestry. So again, we can learn a little bit and maybe practice and hone some of those skills. Again, it's research-based and it's experimentation-based because unfortunately, we do not have an 11th century weapons master who has just popped anywhere to tell us how to do things. We're also able to take some clues from other manuscripts. And again, these are static, just showing a slice of, of life, a moment in the battle. And you can see here that, that they have their arms raised with a particular kind of sword, fighting from horseback, um, different kinds of weapons. But again, just a big melee. And very, very few clues can be gleaned from an artwork like this. Well, as far as martial arts go, it was a skill that was passed from a, from a teacher to a student in a lot of different ways. We all know, or I think most of us know, about the traditional knight and squire relationship, right? A young man would be squired to a knight who had already learned how to fight. He was, he was an expert. This is what he did for a living. He understood weapons. He understood physical fitness. He understood the best way to get the best of an opponent. And taking a squire meant that you were taking on a student. And you would take this student under your wing and this student would live with you. They would spend day after day with you. And in exchange for, for the student doing jobs for the master, that master would also teach the student the ways to fight. Unarmed combat with sword, with shield, with dagger, on horseback, with spear, with lance, all these things. So, but that was again, an oral tradition. Well, surely to goodness, at some point, someone wrote down some of these techniques and maybe did some drawings. Well, they did. We have uh, the earliest known European martial arts guide, which is at, currently at the Royal Armories. It's called Manuscript I-33, and it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we're going to get a lot more into it later because I, I personally think it's fascinating. It's the beginning of what we know of as a learnable method of fighting, a learnable European martial art. Uh, and it has a series of drawings, as you can see here, of different wards or guards and different types of attacks. Now, 
What's interesting, and, and you can see this in some of the videos we'll show later, the postures these guys are in look weird. They look uncomfortable. Can, can something like this even work? Um, yes, as we will find as people have studied these, and these also, as you can see, have written descriptions of what the author, who unfortunately we don't know, thought that he was trying to represent with these illustrations. And so you have a written description of a move or a guard along with a, an illustration. And let me also point out that, the, that this has become very popular. It was a very, very common weapon to have a sword and a buckler. And a buckler is that small shield. And uh, in one of the videos we'll see, that kind of makes a very interesting noise when you have those two fighting together. A, a swash and buckle, swashbuckler, that's where that term comes from, is, is this style of fighting. And, and the swords, again, were just generally those standard European weapons with a pommel, a cross guard, a long blade, and these bucklers would be made of metal or more probably wood covered in leather with perhaps some, some metal reinforces. And again, we're going to come back to this manuscript very, very soon. Now, there are other ones that start to pop up uh, as we research and, and look at the sources as we get more into the 15th century. I'm sorry, let me back. The I-33, by the way, we think was in the 1200s, just so you know. So that's the, that's the first part. Getting into the 1400s, there are a couple of other folks that start to do uh, manuals of fighting. And these, of course, are, are a huge part of what we, we know now about historic European martial arts. Uh, Fiore, uh, Talhofer, a German. So those two names, Fiore, which is Italian, Talhofer, which is German, you're going to see that most of what we can study about these different fighting methods comes from the Italians and the Germans. And you can see here we have a, an illustration of an unarmed fellow taking on a fellow with a dagger. So there are grappling and wrestling moves involved in European martial arts. <clears throat> and going to the next one, uh, you can see that this is also a very popular method, the, the long sword, right? These longer swords, which were pretty much weapons of war, uh, were going to be taught, and this is a very, very popular method of fighting in, in, in the military, in battles. Moving on to the next picture. And again, you see how wonderful these are. These, these illustrations have a lot of neat detail. Uh, here you have two fellows fighting. Uh, one has dropped his sword. How did it get on the ground? We're not sure. But he's slick enough to find a way to trip up his opponent. He's got his arm. He's lifted one leg. His left leg is behind the right leg of his opponent. And you can see he is in the middle of tripping him and throwing him to the ground. Again, great ways that we can learn about this sort of thing. And this is, when I say it's research-based, this is primarily what I'm talking about. We're going finding these manuals that we can. There are other illustrations, uh, like the next one here. Again, mounted combat is an important part of European martial arts, and so some of these manuals do show mounted fighting going on with a sword. There's another one from this same volume that's really interesting. It's almost like weaponless wrestling from horseback. I may have Libba try to pull it, see if she can find that one and pull it up, but it's they're trying to cover a little bit of everything. And also notice, so far, the ones we've shown, except for a couple of helmets, these are unarmed people. And again, it's important to remember that most of the fighters in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance were not wealthy enough to be the knights. They were not wealthy enough to have a lot of armor. And it's also important to remember that if they could wear armor, if they did have armor to wear, that armor is going to be close fitting. It's going to be well fitted to them. It's not going to be that heavy. And they're going to be able to do these techniques and maneuvers in the armor almost as easily as they can do outside of it. So these illustrations really are just to show the basic techniques. Now, moving on. <clears throat> um, so again, the development of gunpowder weapons really starts to put these weapon-related, blade-related fighting methods in the background, in the background, in the background, in the background. And it, and it basically becomes lost. Um, moving into the Elizabethan period, civilians began to carry uh, rapiers, uh, long, thin swords that were primarily meant for thrusting, and civilian duels came into fashion. And that carries on a little bit through the 16th, 17th, 
and a little bit into the 18th century, by the 19th century, civilians aren't carrying swords around anymore. And, but, but the art of sword fighting, somewhat for military necessity in the 19th century, but more and more is a gentlemanly pursuit, which means by this point, only the elites are really practicing anything approaching a, a, a Western European martial art. As a result, they tend to focus on the popular weapons of the time that are going to be used in the military. And well, if everyone's using firearms, the officers themselves are still carrying swords as a symbol and a status rank, and they're going to use the fighting styles and emphasize those styles that, that relate to those swords. So you see uh, here in the picture behind me, these fencing masters are using very thin blades, and they still want a sword fight, even though it's becoming militarily irrelevant. And so the sport of fencing is developed. And again, fencing as we know it today, it, right, when I've got a, a, sh a short video clip coming up, it, it, they're all in white, they have on the mask, they have very, very thin, whippy swords, and as it evolves into a sport, and this is not disparaging for fencing, those guys are really fast and really talented, but modern sport fencing is not very close to combat at all, right? Uh, their whole goal and everything they train for and all of their equipment and all of their movements is to simply score a point. You just have, you don't have to simulate a thrust into an enemy. You literally just have to touch them with the tip of your sword. And it's all electronically scored now. And so here I have a, just a short video of a modern fencing world championship so you can kind of get an idea. We can start from here and then begin to work our way backwards. Now, I, I do think I found that picture you were trying oh, did to you? find. Okay, so yeah, tell me you, if this is it, because it looks like it's from the same it. manuscript. That's it, yes. Thank you, Libba. Okay. That is it. So you can see neither one of these guys have a weapon anymore. The guy's scabbard is even hanging empty, but here they are trying to still grapple with each other in combat from horseback. So they, they tended to cover everything that they thought might come up, and obviously they thought this might come up. All right, so now we're going to watch the Fencing World Championships yes, video. Yes, or at least the, hi the highlight reel. The highlight reel. From the 2019 World Championships. All right, here we go. He kept up a really, really brutal pace today. But couldn't do anything with it. He can do... Oh, that was beauty. Centrelli's just going to start throwing stuff out there. But a double does it. Really is finding. So again, these are these are great athletes, but it's not really a martial art anymore. Uh, couple of things you notice that the kind of make it that not the the space on which the contest takes place is a long thin runway in effect and the movement is back and forth it is back and forth from a combat perspective especially using blades that is not how you fight you're always trying to move you're, you're moving in in several dimensions three dimensions really and with fencing, you're only moving back and forth. And notice how whippy those swords were. Again, they're thrusting around, and if you just touch your enemy's toe tip with the tip of your sword, boom, you score a point. Hooray. Well, in a fight, that's going to get you killed if you're trying to stab their tippy toe. Um, but that's modern fencing. And for a long time, that's what sword fighting was. Right? And, and so, again, this stuff was a lot. So... So how did we get from modern fencing to this seemingly old and yet remarkably new area of Western European martial arts? The internet, basically. Uh, people, your, uh, your host included here, have loved the idea of swords and sword fights. And for a long time, most of what we got was the movies. And when you look at movies from the, from the 50s and the 60s and sometimes the 70s, what you have is people using swords, and they're either just hacking like this, just hacking back and forth, or they're trying to use medieval swords in a very fencing kind of way. It, it doesn't make sense historically, but that's what we had. Um, and there were lots of people interested in this, but we couldn't find any sources. Well, 
couple of things happened. Again, in the 90s, way back there in the 1990s, the internet has really begun to, to take off and people can contact each other and you can make a website and post something up. That I-33 manuscript that I was telling you about, they, they kind of, it had been in the Royal Armories for a long time, but in their annual journal, they published a significantly long story about finding it and what it meant. That article in the journal of the Royal Armories in London can be seen really as one of the, the main uh, beginnings of the modern HEMA movement because people are like, there's a medieval fighting manual, right? We've been, we've been getting into these ads in the comic books, ordering little pamphlets that show us how to fight in karate, and now you tell me, well, there's one, there's one from medieval Europe, and all I have to do is get a sword? Easy. So they took this, and people began to look at it. Then with the internet, people began to build forums, right? And you could send messages, and if you were really good, you might even could post a couple of pictures. People around the world began to talk to each other and say, have you seen I-33? It's amazing. Well, I tried this and I tried that. Well, I want to get a sword for that. Where can I get it? Well, fortunately, now if someone's making a sword, here they have a website. You can order it. Well, what if uh, I learned about this manual that hasn't seen the light of day in 400 years? If I go to the archive and I get copies of it, I can photocopy that, scan it in, and post that on the internet. And then everyone has access to that. Um, so these manuals, some one person could go to the archives in Germany, uh, refine this Talhofer manuscript, scan it, and put it up on the web. And suddenly tens of thousands of people have access to that and can start talking about it and can start practicing with it. And companies, this is sort of the... the uh, the early renaissance, if you want, of, of HEMA and of armor and swords and things like that. The internet brings all these communities together. It's what social media is supposed to do, right? We're sharing with you right now. That's what social media is supposed to do. And so these individuals started to form groups, and then these groups could begin communicating with each other. <clears throat> that began to have a fantastic effect on the incredibly fast spread of, of things. And again, everyone at this point was an amateur. They may have some fencing skills, they may be in good shape, they may understand body dynamics and movement, but everyone at this point was an amateur and people who were really interested were able to begin spending time studying this and trying to, to figure out, trying to recreate these fighting styles without a master to teach them. So, you know, moving to the next slide, we can, we can say, or is the, my next move, the movie's next, isn't yeah. it? So, um, so as people began to study this, they began to sort out basically with sticks and with modern fencing equipment, right? The mask and the, the pads and things like that. Well, they wanted to get faster. They wanted to use real weapons. They wanted to use real weapons to spar with, right? So you're not going to sharpen your sword, but you are going to buy a sword and maybe make it dull. Um, then you're going to get one of those little bucklers. And, and if you've got this, and you've got a copy of I-33, and you've got a buddy who has the same thing, you can start practicing those moves. And that, my friends, is a game changer. And to that end, after, very quickly, schools began to form, and people who really studied it began to teach other people. And like any other art, like any other physical skill, uh, there were people who had a particular talent, just just an inborn talent for this sort of thing. And they became excited about it. And they uh, wanted to teach. It's, it's interesting. We have this, and this is not necessarily true, but this idea of the mystique of Eastern martial arts, right? The higher you go, you're learning secret methods and, and your master is only teaching you certain things. That's not the case in HEMA. In HEMA, they're trying to teach you everything at once. Uh, you get the equipment, you begin to practice, and you begin to reconstruct it. So... Following up, what I have is a series of, of four videos. The first one's a little long because it, it discusses I-33, and it, this, it's, the video is from the Royal Armories, and they not only talk a little bit about the manuscript, they talk about how we're able to pick parts out of it and interpret that, and then turn that into a practicing martial art, beginning of those moves. So this one is a little bit long, but I think it's going to be worth it, so we can go to that video right now. 
Manuscript 133, or the World Purges Fight Book, is the oldest known European fencing manual. It was originally written in Germany in the early part of the 14th century and now resides at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. The manuscript details a system of fencing with a weapon combat system of sword and buckler, consisting of seven custodia, wards or guards, and describes over 36 different sequences or plays. Here at the European Historical Martial Arts Club at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, we have been studying sword and buckler and the mysteries of 133 alongside other martial traditions of medieval Europe for many years. Hi, my name is Dean Davidson. This is Stuart Ivanson. We're from the European Historical Combat Guild and KDF here in Leeds. We're also active members with the Society for Combat Archaeology. What we're trying to do with these films is present some of our thoughts and interpretations around the plays in 133. We hope you enjoy. So the play that we're going to demonstrate in this film is the first play. It consists of four images and covers two pages of the manuscript. The text which accompanies the first image reads as follows. Note that here we show the first guard or underarm and the opposition is half shield or half shield. And I advise with good counsel that he who stands in underarm should not deliver any blow, something that is rationally demonstrated. For he cannot reach his opponent's upper part if he attacks the lower part, it will be dangerous to his head. But the one who adopts the opposition can enter and attack him at any time if he omits what he ought to do as is written below. So what does this actually mean? So, here the priest is told to take first ward. The student, in contrast, is given two options as a counter to first ward, that of long point and that of half shield. Half shield is adopted by the student, even though it is not one of the seven previously identified custodia or wards. As the priest takes this position, they're immediately told that if they do nothing, they're in a disadvantageous position as the student will initiate a strike over the top. Conversely, the priest is also told that they should not aim at the lower openings of their opponent so as to allow their head to be hit during the process. Here we have a simple mechanical uh, action where the student works over the hands of the priest to give themselves a geometric advantage. If the priest doesn't learn from the rest of the teachings, this will be a repetitive outcome with the student winning each time from a more dominant guard position. The text which accompanies the second image continues. When half shield is adopted, fall under the sword and shield. If he is ordinary, he will go for your head. You should use a thrust strike, stichschlag. If he counterbinds and steps, your counters should be a shield strike, Schildslag. Note that he who lies above sends a blow towards the head without a shield strike if he is an ordinary combatant. But if you wish to learn from the priest's advice, then counterbind and step. So, this gives us a, a position whereby which, after the initial guards are taken and the student comes into distance, the priest is told to fall below the opponent's sword and shield. This action here would clear the line in order to give the priest a direct control of the bind. If the student is uninitiated or ordinary, they would then aim at the priest's head, at which point the priest would use both the sword and shield to deliver both the thrust with the sword and engage with the shield. This action here would achieve such an outcome for the priest. The student knows that this is a disadvantage, so the student takes the option, opportunity here, of counterbinding the priest's sword. But they are also told in a few minutes that they should not hesitate at this point, because if they do, it gives the priest the option of engaging their shield with their own shield strike and then they have various different options to press home such an advantage. 
The text which accompanies the third and fourth images of the play picks up just after the student has counterbound and stepped and reads, note that here the student counterbinds and steps so that he can get a shield strike as follows. But let him beware of those things that the priest should do because after the counterbind, the priest will be the first to act. Note also that the student has nothing he can do but a shield strike or to use his left hand to envelop the priest's arms i.e. his sword and shield. So here the image has been flipped. This is often beneficial in 133 as it gives us the option to visualise an alternative perspective of the play in action. The priest begins in first ward, the student in half shield, the priest falls below the sword and shield, the student counters and engages with their buckler using a shield strike creating an opening for them to aim at the priest's head. An alternative action that the student is given is to use their buckler to envelop the priest's sword and shield during that action. In that position, the priest is told later in the text the ways in which they may get out of that particular predicament. But what we will do is take the play right back to its beginning and run all the way through without any additional commentary. So this is the position that we find the first play finishing in. At at the latter point, the priest is given three additional options as counters to the opponent and we will look at those in subsequent videos. So we hope you've enjoyed this first video that we've delivered under 133. Uh, there will be more to follow um, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you. So again, I, I personally find that very interesting. Not only are we looking at this manual, but I wanted you to watch that so you, that you could see how people text and they're through the close reading and close observation, learning how those motions can flow one to the other. And, and you can start to see how this could be developed into different techniques to put it all together and become a martial artist. And so, what well, that video was really about looking at the text, studying the text, and figuring out how exactly to go about slowly perfecting the movements and the methods of the sword and the buckler. This next video is from another, uh, for another great uh, person on YouTube you can follow, and he they have on protective gear, and it, it's filmed from a different angle, and you can kind of see how he's able to make those different moves. He goes through the same thing as they did, sort of one section of the manuscript, but you can see how a lot of that can actually interact in a little bit faster method. First of all, you have to know that in this video we will not analyze a single action, but a series of action that seems to end with the failed attempt of a cross-handed disarm shown in the folio 4 recto. So everything starts with our standard counterbind. Our opponent has arms under his buckler and then instantly strike his upward blow, an Unterhau in German, toward our head. This technique is very simple and straightforward. We can compare it to a simple first intention thrust, but executed with the shield instead of the sword, which is the very foundation of almost every other action of the book. The Mutatio Gladi is a way to flee from the bind and recover a superior position over the opponent's sword. His actions have two goals, to beat or bind down and control the opponent's sword if we caught him early during his binding action or to parry the incoming Unterhau. In the end, our result is the same, controlling the opponent's sword to gain time or tempo to hit back. We hit back with uh, what the priest calls Nuken, a blow which is not well described in the book, but we know that the Nuken 
leads to a separation of the opponent's sword and shield. So by crossing this information, and my Fiore de Liberi experience of the play Rompere di Punta, which share a huge amount of similarities with this play, I have come to the conclusion that the Nuken is a false edge cut shot toward the opponent's head. Now, for our opponent, the fastest way to parry this attack is to use the shield, because it would be extremely hard or even impossible sometimes to use the sword to parry this action, and this is simply because we are over his sword and we gained some time to strike our action. By parrying the action with the shield, he saved himself, but he opened a clear way between the weapons, exposing a target which... So we go for a second blow to enter between the weapons and cut down the arm of our opponent as fast as possible. The last chance of our opponent is the one depicted in the folio 4 recto, a cross-armed disarm. This action is of course completely unsafe, as a sword fighting in general by the way, but uh, it have a good chance to stop the opponent's weapon and throw it away if executed at the proper time. Now, knowing that this action may happen, the priest suggests us to avoid reaching this situation, because it may lead to a wrestling action. First of all, you have to know that in this video we will not analyze a single action, but a series So I... Just tell Lib, I could watch that all day, and, and a couple of things I want you to notice from that video. Number one, they are going through this the same motion, the same technique, several different times. Again, as you would when you're learning a martial art. You're not trying to learn an entire you know, series of movements at once. You're going through the same thing to learn how it works over and over so that you can develop muscle memory. That's what those guys were doing. It's very interesting. And the one thing I love about this video too is that they show you the progression of how a fight may go using some of these techniques. First it's this, first it's this, then it's that, then it's that. Again, it's very deliberate. Something else too uh, that I hope this video kind of made you think about. Uh, we often think of swords and sword fights, right? This is an edged weapon. You want to cut someone and we always think about ah, just coming down and just hacking as hard as we can. Notice in that video, it's just a little pop, right? It's a sharp blade. If it just hits your head right here, you don't have to have a baseball bat kind of swing to cause a cut, to cause a concussion, to cause damage. You're not having to just literally overpower your opponent with every single strike of the sword. It's finesse. Even with a large medieval broadsword to the head, around the eye, can be very, very basic, doesn't have to have a lot of force behind it, but it's going to end the fight, like a martial art is supposed to do. Now, that's uh, I-33, that's Manuscript 33, a couple of those videos. Again, it's just fascinating because that's the first one that we have, and a lot of people have studied that method of fighting. Moving on a little bit later, as, as he said with you know Fiore and Talhofer, the long sword, the longer sword, two hand, is a very, very popular way to fight. So let me back up. The spear is an incredibly common weapon because it's a stick with a pointy end on it, right? Very, very common. So of course the fighting manuals did take a look at how a spear could be used. It's going to be by far the most common weapon. And we have a video here showing some of the same type of movements and motions and practices with a spear. And I wanted to show you this because a spear being an old weapon I have to think, and don't ask me to prove this, but I have to think that a lot of these methods of, of attack and defense with a spear are going to go all the, all the way back to when spears were first developed, right? It, it's, you don't have to depend upon the Renaissance to discover a new way to use a weapon. These, these folks have been fighting with spears for thousands of years. So I have to think a lot of these techniques are going to be very, very steeped in the past, even though they're only being shown to us in a manual from the 1400s. So let's go to this spear practice video.
So spears. So now moving forward, uh, the long sword. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, long sword is a very common, very popular technique, and within the the Hema world, I'm not sure if sword and buckler are more popular or long sword. Probably long sword because it's just the one weapon, right? You don't have to to worry about two different things going on, and it again, it seems like a big massive power weapon, but there's a lot of finesse to it. So I've got a short video here of a couple of guys from Blood and Iron uh, Hema sparring, just so you can kind of see how an actual two people who know the techniques are going through an unscripted, unplanned sparring to see how the sword dynamics work. Oh, doesn't that look like fun? It looks like fun. Uh, and notice how much like a dance it can it can sort of look because it's all about timing, it's about balance, it's about distance, same way as dance. And this is something I was mentioning before. Notice the modern fencing is very back and forth and back and forth. That longsword video, definitely they're moving around in a lot of different dimensions. It is not back and forth. There's lots of blocks, lots of attacks, where it's non-linear. So that's an important thing to remember with actual sword-based martial arts. That's just scratching the surface, folks. There's so much else that I could go into. I myself have a little bit of experience uh, here in this next picture. You can see some of the fun I had. That's me on the right, jousting with my old buddy Dave Hansen, and that's why they called me the Headshot King. Uh, he was fine, he was fine. He recovered great, but that's a lot of fun. What kind of resources are there for HEMA if you want to look up more stuff? Tons. Uh, you know, on YouTube, there's some great channels. Besides the ones of the videos we've already shown, Demicator, if you look up Demicator, he is fascinating. He's got so many great videos. Royal Armories, of course, and Scola Gladiatora is a great place. He has a school there, and he goes through a lot of these basic... Basically, you could learn a lot of this just by getting a couple of pieces of equipment, watching YouTube, and, and sort of mirroring their motions. Uh, there's some great resources online. I've got just a couple here. And these two really are sort of clearing houses with lots of links to other places. The first one, of course, historicaleuropeanmartialarts.com just has a lot of different resources. Has a great FAQ to kind of take you through the basics of what this is. And wichtenauer.com is a database of all the fight manuals that the guy who's put that website together can find. So it is a vast resource of those types of things. Just a couple of books that are out there. Uh, Medieval Combat by Mark Rector, Longsword Mechanics by Guy Wilson. There's a ton of other ones. I will say that Mark Rector is one of those folks who very early on in the 90s started trying to look at these manuals and interpret them in a very you know, disciplined way. 
Facebook. There are lots of Facebook groups out there, and so look for one near you. Most of the there are, I want to say about 350 schools around the United States now that teach some form of HEMA. And if you're really interested, you can go and and look for one. And they're great folks. They're always willing to have uh, new students and and places and people to share their their thoughts, their feelings. Their, their experiences with, and just Google it. Just Google HEMA, you're gonna come up with a ton of stuff. Again, we've just scratched the surface here. There's so much to cover, and I have barely left any time for questions, which I apologize for. I get really excited about this topic, but but Libba, if there's anyone out there that has a question, I'll be happy to answer it. I think we did get one. Someone mentioned why they'd get a bigger shield than this, than this buckler. Well, a good point, if you're going into battle, you're going to want a big shield, but this buckler is something that people would carry on them. Uh, as I said, a, a person would carry a sword on their on their belt, as you can imagine, and this buckler even could have a little leather thong and hang. I don't know if I can oh, get this to work right, and just hang over the sword like that as you carry it. It's very, very easy. It's a very, very effective, as you saw, a defensive and offensive weapon, but it's not big and bulky like a battle shield. So that, that's why they would have had a buckler such as that. All right. Uh, so we did have a, we have a comment from Dave and um, a question from Susan. So uh, Dave, David mentioned that in Europe that uh, maybe one connection as to why Europeans drive on the uh, right side of the road. Wait, what did he say? Well, <laughs> the, the, the Brits drive on the left On the side. left, yeah. So and that, they, yeah. So he was saying that like if you're a knight, right, then you need your knight, sword hand free. <laughs> you're going to have it over here and, and your lance is going to be over there. But yeah. that, does, that doesn't explain the French. The, fr the rest of Europe, oh, right, the rest yeah. of Europe drives on the correct side of the road the way we do here in the states. But it is fun to think about those connections it, it, that, it really uh, that is. might have some emphasis. Um, so that's cool. Uh, Susan asks, are there any European sources that focus only on fist fighting? So any any fighting oh, techniques for no, fist fighting? Most of, to, to my knowledge, I'm not an expert in this area, despite the fact that I've just talked for an hour about it. Um, but to my knowledge. There aren't any manuals that are just fist fighting or unarmed combat. They remember they're um, they're built to approach and connect with an audience, and an audience like Tal Hoffer and those manuals I was talking about before. They're going to try to cover as much material as possible: uh, armed, unarmed, sword, spear, mounted, un dismounted, things like that. So, but I I personally can't think of just an unarmed combat manual from from medieval or renaissance europe but but check that wittenauer site they may have something there all right um i don't think we have any more questions but i did want to mention that if you're interested in helping us reach our january donation oh, yes. goal we're trying to get to 200 dollars in january we've had um so many generous people uh donate already so you can go to the link in the chat that I just put down there, or you can just type it in yourself, uh, bit.ly slash jangle right there. And also, if you're new to us in our live streams, uh, Glenn, why don't you give them the overview of who who are we? Yeah, who in the, who in the world are we? Uh, we are the Northeast Georgia History Center. We are in Gainesville, Georgia. We are a regional history museum, but we also have been blessed to have this digital studio created thanks to the Contrail Foundation. And starting back in March with all the COVID and pandemic days, we wanted to reach as many people as possible and really just kind of provide some, some lighthearted education, uh, masquerading as entertainment for folks, and kind of contextualize the world, I guess you could say. So we've begun a lot of these digital programs, and now we're doing uh, a live public program every Wednesday at 2, which is where you've joined me here. We also have a members-only uh, live stream that happens on Friday at 2. Memberships are how we're able to sustain the programs that we do, both in person and here digitally. And so if you are uh, interested in becoming a member, you can go to the link that's in the chat that Libba just put in there. Uh, you can be, uh, it's as low as $35 for a digital membership, which gives you access to all of our online stuff. And you can pay for that for as little as $3 a month if you want to sign up that way. If you're local to the area and you think you might be interested in coming in, uh, to the museum on a regular basis, bringing your family, attending some of our family days, uh, you can become a more traditional member. That level goes anywhere from 35 individually 
up to $5,000 if that's the sort of thing that interests you and you really want to boost us up. But we have a great audience. We have a great staff here that's able to bring these programs to you. All right, our last uh, bit of uh, let's see comments today we have, oh, can you talk about a uh, Krav Maga. Krav Maga. So, yes, I can very briefly, I know that if I was going to start over and start learning an, an unarmed martial art, this is the one I would learn. This was developed, I believe, by a, uh, a Hungarian gentleman in the 20th century, a, a kickboxer or just a regular boxer, uh, who was of Jewish descent, and he uh, migrated to, to Israel during all the, you know, the, the post-World War II times when Israel was becoming a nation, and created this method of very, very real-world, practical, disarmed fighting. And it's been adopted by the Israeli military and police force. And it is all about, I mean, it's almost co it's Cobra Kai for the real world, right? Strike first, strike hard, and you keep hitting until the enemy is um, no longer a threat. It is, it's really neat. It uses the whole body. It is uh, all about the overwhelming use of a force. So, uh, but, but I'm not sure it can necessarily fall into the category of historic European martial arts, given that it is created in the mid to, I guess, say mid 20th century. Uh, very effective, but not HEMA per se. All right, and lastly, before we head out, um, if you would like to suggest any programs, uh, something, yes. what, what do you want to learn about this year? We would love to know. I've put our uh, program survey in the chat, so anyone is welcome to share what they would like to learn this year. And uh, we hope that you'll also join us for our future members' live streams. Our next one is going to be about Anne Boleyn, and that's going to be presented by Marie yes. <laughs> this Friday at 2 p.m. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, we will leave it there. Thank everyone who tuned in. Normally, we sign off by staying, uh, stay safe and take care. But if you're going to take up historic European martial arts, we want you to stay safe, but maybe not too safe. Have a little bit of fun, but definitely take care. Oh, and well, thank you so much, David, for that donation. We just oh, saw that. Thank you, thank David, you. so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we will see you next time. All right. Take Thanks care, y'all.